Uh, all right. Uh, do we do some intro thing or do we just jump right into this? I think it's fine to just jump into this. All right, sounds good. Okay, functions. Arguably the most important part of a programming language. Um, so yeah, beginning here, it goes over function calls. This is the usual C style function call here. Um, yeah, so it starts, just sticks into the grammar. Nothing, nothing too exciting here. It's kind of the same boilerplate of plugging things into the grammar for the call. I did find it kind of interesting that he starts with the function call instead of the function definition, but I guess that makes makes more sense in some some way. Yeah, I think he, it's tough because there's like a lot of different things you need to like you want to optimize for. And not just with this thing, but I feel like oftentimes in the book, the order that we do things in makes it hard to test because like you can't, a lot of times you can't use the things that you built until like a lot later, you know? So you just have to like blindly code things and then you can't run it until like a long time later, which is not good. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's like the best way for like a teaching style, but yeah, it's not till like the end of the native function section that we can actually run anything that we've put in here. Yeah, and this happens a lot. And like, I feel like it's the best for introducing topics slowly, but like, you know, like when we, you know, like when we made the parser, we made the interpreter, you know, like the wiring it up part is always at the end, you know? So, and it's the same in this chapter. So it's, I think it's good for like telling people how it works, but it's not good for coding it. Yeah. Yeah, if you're to go off and write your own interpreter after this, wouldn't do it exactly in this order. Though I might still do function calls first. I, I kind of like the function call and then native functions just because the function call is a bit simpler construct than the actual function. Yeah, I think native functions, because like to actually make function declarations and all that, like that's a lot of work, but to just make a few native functions to start, I think is a good good way to do it. Because then you have like something, right? You can- Yeah. Yeah. Also another thing that I found interesting is that they, you keep the the token kind of scattered here when you're making your your call node you keep the the last parentheses token just in the call node as your as your location just, oh yeah that's uh unusual design decision but yeah it's it works yeah i when it, when it started up here and he like had the parentheses, I, I just assumed it'd be the left parentheses. I don't know why I assumed that, but it's the right one. Small, small detail that I found interesting there. All right, so yeah, so there's that boilerplate, get the get it parsed, and then the maximum argument count. I found it interesting that we had to had to think about that. Because the second part is coding in C, so. Yeah, so I guess we have to. Yeah, I wonder what, like, how the design is in C that we have a 255 argument upper limit. It's a mystery. It's probably right? a fixed buffer. Yeah. Fix this yeah. So. I know we're gonna be actually calling C, like we're not gonna be writing C functions. So it's like the arguments. I mean, it's actually similar to what we're doing in the Java part, right? Because like we're not calling any Java methods with more than two hundred fifty-five arguments. It's just a list that we pass into it. 
So we're going to do the same thing in C so it could have any size. Yeah. Yeah, what I was thinking is maybe it's just using a, a byte to store the arity in C, but who knows? Well, we'll get there eventually. All right, and then the interpreting part. Uh, let's see. Let's see what I found interesting here. It's also kind of similar boiler boilerplate, except for this part right here that this really threw me off <laughs> is that you, so you evaluate it and then you cast it to your locks callable interface. That really threw off some de design decisions that I had made in mine just because he uses a uh, object here for your locks type. And I didn't, I didn't think to have my locks type be callable like that. So I had to completely rewrite how I have locks objects. So that's that's why I never finished the <laughs> finished this chapter. Yeah, that, this is a right. problem for me too because I I'm doing it in in Kotlin and I'm using an any type, but. To make it anything callable, you have to like do extra stuff. So um, it's a challenge for me too. Yeah. I, there are some kind of magic hole. in the cast too. Like the cast here may fail. It's just if it fails, it will just throw an exception. Yeah. And I think, uh, oh yeah, it's down here. Where you, yeah, you make sure that it's actually callable before you do the call. And throw your runtime error. And one one side note. Now that I'm looking at this, is if you you do the right right casting on a string literal, you can do this in C and call it. All right, okay, yeah, so arity, you're just making sure you're passing the right number of parameters, like that it, I feel like there's always a, a, a subtle dig at JavaScript when, when possible. There's always the interesting design choice that JavaScript makes that everyone agrees is wrong. <laughs> Yeah, to not not check your arity. Well, to be fair, K and R C in nineteen seventy two was not any better. That's true. Yeah, you could you could get away with the arity stuff. And I've never heard someone defending JavaScript by saying, "Well, in K and R C style function declarations, it's fine." Yeah. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not bad by JavaScript is in nineties, so it's a bit different from T and R C though. <laughs> yeah, I don't think C is also also not the the thing you point at for great design decisions, but got the benefit of being older. So yeah, we check for arity. Um All right, and now on to native functions. So we can actually use our function call. Uh, I like the, the side note here that the two different names like native function or foreign function are like complete opposite, but they refer to the same, same thing here. Found that funny. I also like the doodles, they're always good. <laughs> so yeah so you just do one native function call do the the clock uh 
the other other mechanism or option for adding native function to FFI. I've always found a foreign function interface pretty pretty interesting. Actually, since I'm I'm working on on the Java on a JVM, that's what that's what I do for my job. I've been looking at Java's new. They've got a new uh, FFI Java proposal, and that's so it's it's been interesting to look at that. Good. Oh, uh, they have a new stuff. Uh, yeah, it's a. I don't know a whole ton about it. It's one of the Java, the JEP Java, whatever it stands for, the proposal to add a better FFI to Java. So this be like a replacement for JNI? Uh, I think, yeah, a replacement or an improvement. And it's like Java 21 or something that's coming in though, so. That sounds cool. Yeah, interesting GNI thing down the line. not nice. <laughs> no, JNI is, is a pain. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that would be an interesting thing to add to Lox just as like afterwards, add an FFI just to see how implementing that from start to end works. It's probably a pain and not worth it. Also, for logs, it has two implementations. So, like, what the native function means in this case is, I, I guess we can add FFI to the C version for the because it probably means different thing in the Java version, right? In the Java version, the FFI probably means like calling Java functions. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in other JVM languages, like say you're doing Kotlin or Clojure, is a native function, does that refer to a Java function or does that refer to a C function? I think it's still referred to a C function. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, okay. So telling time. Interesting that the one one uh, native function we stick in is uh, time, just so we can get those those benchmarks. And always see how fast we're going. Uh, I saw, <laughs> I read a blog post of someone that they they did crafting interpreters and they implemented box in itself, like bootstrap the interpreter. They just like the only changes they had to do was add a couple native functions for uh file IO, I think it was. This, this is another thing that was very Java that threw off my implementation is the the what's it called? The anonymous object with the the class. I think it's a very, very clever way to do it in Java, but it always throws me off when I'm trying to translate it over. And there's another side note here on Lisp one versus Lisp two. And I've heard those, heard those terms thrown around, but I've never like bothered to figure out what they mean. But yeah, so it's like common Lisp. You have your function names and your variable names and they're in separate namespaces. So that's a Lisp two and you got two separate namespaces and then something like scheme or locks as well. Lisp one, because your functions and variables are in the same namespace. Another interesting side note there. All right, so now on to declarations and get the actual walks functions. Um, 
again, just generic boilerplate of sticking it in, except for this one, one part here. I'm going to add the argument to your function, uh, I guess, function, function, <laughs> to your, your function AS, your or syntax rule. So you can have the right error if you get a thing there. It's weird to use a string rather than an enum in this case, though. <laughs> a string. Oh, yeah. Because I guess, yeah, you're only, it'd only be like a method or a function. It's the only two things you could pass in. I guess with only two, you could pass in a bool, but that's a, that's a good anti-pattern there. <laughs> And then, yeah, just your general, stick it in. Um, actually, I have one comment on, yeah, on the function here. I've always found it interesting for like C and I guess basically any other language, most languages I've looked at, where a function is a statement, it's always a block statement. I've always wondered why can't you just have that just as a just statement, any statement. So if you had a single statement function, you could just. Well, yeah, this is what. Like, yeah, I mean, other languages have that, right? Um, like uh, you can do that in Kotlin. Yeah. 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 But Kotlin, I think, Kotlin I think it's either a block or an expression, not a statement, but it's equal to some expression. So I equal sign before that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's also how it is in Scala too. Is that you do like equal. So I guess it is a yeah. So you could say equals and then that's how it works. Yeah, it I think it actually goes into that a little bit when you get down to the return statements where you've got your languages where your function's a a statement versus or your function body is a statement versus a expression. It's an interesting design choice. It's one thing I've always wanted when writing C or C++. So if I've just got one statement there, can I skip the curly braces? I don't know. Probably there are some parsing problem. Yeah, probably some. Well, definitely in C plus ambiguity. Um, in I mean, what I do is like if I have a bunch of really short functions that I have to make in like C, I'll just put the curlies on the same line. You know, so like if I have a function that like just returns one, you know, I could just say like, you know, I put the curly and then return one and then the end curly on the same line. Yeah, yeah, that's what. I end up doing a lot of the time. Yeah, there's probably some grammar ambiguity problem if you skip, if you make it just a generic statement instead of a block statement. There's also the, the fun keyword. It's that keyword to start your, uh, function. I've noticed in a couple like languages that I've implemented quickly, just having that that keyword to start your function really makes your grammar a whole lot more simple than the C style where you just have the name and whatever. Or type then name. So yeah, interesting how those things that look just like style change your grammar quite a bit. All right, yeah, all that fun parsing stuff. And then what functions look like. So this, this call bit, I, I kind of skimmed, just skimmed past it because like I'm not 
implementing my my thing in Java, so I'm not looking too closely at the code until I'm actually implementing it. Then I got back to where was the note? Right here. <laughs> it was like this code's pretty simple. <laughs> But then this is one of my favorite snippets in this entire book. Feel free to take a moment to meditate on it if you're so inclined. So I read that bit. I'm like, wait, the code didn't look that interesting. So I had to go back and look at it and figure out what was interesting. So I went back, looked at it. And I what, what I found interesting was that it's just so, so simple. <laughs> You just set up the environment, stick in your values, and then just execute the block. Which is like, even though we're doing like some fancy tree walker interpreter in Java, it's like essentially the same way you'd call a function in assembly. You just set up your arguments, jump to your block. I think the interesting thing is that this setup, the like its own environment for the function because well when we look at the code it's simple but if you like code a language code an interpreter according to a language spec without any reference i like why did my programming language class that's something my classmate often messed up is like the environment Yeah, you gotta, yeah, make sure each call gets its own environment instead of each function. I've made made that mistake before too. <laughs> and then when you start getting recursive functions and everything breaks down and you have to dig through it. Yeah, and I mean, it's also like slow. So like in a real, like, so a lot of uh, compilers and interpreters will like they'll do a lot of tricks to optimize those things because in real programs you're going to have a lot of nested functions so yeah yeah definitely not designing for performance here but, yeah Yeah, so he goes over here, he, he talks about that, the, the problem there, why, why you need the environment for each call and not for each uh, function. So you can get those recursive functions working. Yeah, because you don't want your, when you redefine n, when you call it again, you don't want that to overwrite your, your n you had. Uh, in the parent call. So yeah, it's pretty simple. Just stick your things in, evaluate, stick your things in your environment and evaluate your, your block. Here we go now. Function declarations. Is that interpreting? Yeah, so you just get your block, stick it in the environment under the right name, and you're good to go. So, yeah, we've got a pretty reasonable programming language at this point. Then uh, at this point, there's no return. We can't get stuff out. So far, this has been my favorite comment on the side, the Hotel California of data. Put stuff in, but can never leave.
All right, and then return statement so you can get stuff out. Um, yeah, walks is dynamically typed, so we don't have to worry about void functions. We just do a print return nil if there's no return value, and we don't have to worry about checking the type of the function. We just make sure we've got the, the right stuff when we get to our, our operations. Yeah, more parser boilerplate. And then the, uh, how do we interpret the return? And uh, the way he does it here is he, he uses exceptions because you want to break out all the way from your visit return statement all the way to your visit call expression. And yeah, so I don't know, using exceptions seems. Yeah, that was pretty nasty when I saw that. Yeah, it, it always seems like a dirty trick. But honestly, I don't know like how how else would you do that besides like returning an option from each of these and going all the way up, checking your option or whatever, or some sort of you know. Yeah, know, you guys have some sort of like state machine in your function that like, I don't know. I don't know. I also heard people using exception for parsing for the same reason. It's just too deep in the stack. Just use exception, boom, it works. Yeah, it feels dirty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how are you going to do this in C? You won't have exceptions. This does Java have go tos? Java does not have go tos. No. So the C version is completely different. We don't do this kind of tree working. So we don't have a very deep stack. Yeah, the, the C version is, is a byte code machine. So you just, your return yeah, is. Yeah, emit a return byte code. Byte code. So, yeah, it is basically a go to at that point. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's kind of dirty, but I don't know how else you do it without it being equally dirty. And yeah, some special Java stuff there in the super constructor to make sure you don't have your stack trace overhead. Like he even says here he's not a not a fan of using exceptions for control flow, but with your recursive tree walk interpreter, it's the way to do it. I feel like if we have something like an optional type using something like that with a monadic uh type, then it can be okay, just not using exceptions. Otherwise, if, if we were just using a Boolean flag, it would be very messy. Yeah. Yeah, something monadic would be theoretically less sketchy. <laughs> but yeah, the performance on that would probably be worse. <laughs> Well, it would do the same thing. Yeah. Well, it's exception as a control flow is also very slow, right? Exception is if you don't use it, it's fast, but that's why it's called exception. It's for exceptional stuff. But if it's a control flow, it means sometimes you will hit it. And at that time it is slow. Yeah, depends depends on the language and the the implementation. Yeah, I guess I'm just talking about a typical implementation, but yeah, some yeah. other implementation may be different. Yeah, 
interesting, interesting choice. So yeah, now we've got good re recursion and everything. And now it's on to local, local functions. So this is just, you can have a function inside a walk and then return that out. And then you've got to worry about closures here. And that's where we're having a, a garbage collector really comes in handy. <laughs> um, yeah. Assume we all all know how closures work here. The count would just keep the reference to i, keep i alive while after the return, the function count is returned. So then we gotta see how we do that. So now every function you add the closure field so you can keep track of the environment and keep that captured. But yeah, if you were optimizing, there's probably some way to get rid of that overhead and only do it when you're actually closing over something. Well, yeah, I mean, there's more performance implications too. And when trying to figure out closures, I have, I have no clue how to make that fast. I, don't, I haven't looked at like how any JavaScript engines do that, but it would be interesting. The JavaScript engine doesn't do tree walking, so it doesn't matter. This version will be very slow anyway. No, I mean like sp specifically for closures, how they can how they can make that fast by like, for example, like not, uh, like not duplicating everything all the time. Yeah, there is. And like figuring out the things that you're closing over, like that's another thing, right? To figure out the, what you're closing over. Yeah, there's a whole analysis step you can do in that. So, so you know what you're closing over and then there's yeah, yeah. ways to optimize that. Yeah, I know that, but like I'm, I'd be curious to figure out which exact techniques because that seems really hard. I'm trying to think about it, and I don't know how I would do that. Yeah, it's. I think there's I some. I think it's probably a tired version. Like, uh, like first we do, like similar to the part two of the book, like the a bytecode interpreter, and if it is used a bunch of times, then we jit it. Okay. And at that time, we do some compiler optimizations. Yeah, that makes sense. Because also, I guess in JavaScript, you can't even know, like, you can't guarantee to know what you're closing over, right? Because you have, like, eval and yeah. weird stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's why in, isn't it in the C++ lambdas, you have to, like, explicitly say what you're closing over. Yeah, and, that's yeah, just a good sure. though. What? Yeah. Like in Rust, you don't need to, which means in C++, in theory, you don't need to. That's just a design decision C++ make. And C++ yeah. also yeah. have a way to like capture. Yeah, you can capture everything, everything, but it doesn't actually capture everything. It'll just act capture completely. everything used. Yeah, it'll just figure it out. Yeah, it's your, what is it? You get your free variables of your lambda and your subtract, your very free variables of your outer function or whatever, whatever the fancy computer science thing there is. Well, I mean, in C++ is also more complicated because you can capture things by reference or you can copy them. So, so if you're, so you have to figure out what you're going to copy or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah, same Lots with of... Rust. That's why Rust has multiple versions of Lambda. 
Yeah, I don't know Russ, but I'd imagine they it's a similar thing. Yeah, similar situation. Yeah. So yeah, I figure if you're like borrowing it or whatever the heck you do in Rust. Yeah, I think that's where lifetime's coming. I don't know. My my rust is a uh, rusty, excuse the pun. You know, and speaking of that pun, I actually found out last week that rust, the name of the language, is not named after oxidizing iron. It's actually named after like some plant somewhere. And the relation to like, you know, the chemical, the chemistry concept is coincidental. <laughs> okay. <Wow. laughs> By the way, that was on like Twitter. So that could just be fake news, but yeah. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I thought you would say something like anymore. Rust is named after that video game. That will be. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because I had a colleague, like, he always complained that every time I search Rust, like, that video game is uh, at the first place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, actually, uh, Wikipedia also confirms it. So, there well, it, then it must be my, true, right? There's my proof. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. There's my proof in the chat. Oh, is it just the same? After yeah. rust fungi, in reference to their hardiness. What an interesting name. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is also, this was actually just added to Wikipedia last week when I heard about this. On, so who knows? Maybe this is just some elaborate fake news. <laughs> Oh, there's there's a reference there. Yeah, but the reference was like a week ago when I also heard about this. Oh yeah, yeah. I heard about this article. I just it's in my to read list, which is as long as my to watch list on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That was a fun rabbit hole. I don't remember where we are. Okay, yeah, challenges. Uh, interpreter checks number of arguments, passes the function. Does does the arity check for every call? But small talk implementations don't have that problem. Does anyone here know small talk enough to actually answer this question? Because I'm curious to know, but I'm not curious enough to go and learn small talk. Yeah, so when it means it says it doesn't have that problem, does that mean that which problem does it not have? Like, it, like it doesn't do it at runtime or does, doesn't have to do the the arity check for every call. I'm guess I mean, isn't the answer because it does it at compile time? Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, I don't know small talk, but I just imagine like if it doesn't do it at runtime, talk is a I, it interpreted it language as well, so it doesn't have a compile time. Dynamic type language can certainly have a compile time component. It can and do some semantic analysis. It's it's just doesn't do type checking. Also, we have like TypeScript, which is even more complicated. So yeah. I don't know. This boundary yeah. is blurry. Hmm. Yeah, be interesting to know the answer to this question. Mm -hmm. Guessing it has something to do with message passing or whatever small talk uses. Yeah, that's all I know about small talk message passing things. I don't know. Yeah, suppose yeah. they are the real OOP and everyone else we are using is fake OOP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, I assume that when it's saying that, I bet however small talk does, it does have performance costs as well. And probably just yeah. performance costs. Like if the way that, for example, you could say, well, JavaScript also, you know, JavaScript at runtime, it doesn't have to check ARD either. So JavaScript doesn't have the performance costs of 
you know, having of, uh, you know, having different argument lengths pass into functions. But you can't say that it doesn't have a performance cost because it doesn't have that performance cost of having to check parity, but it has the performance cost of, you know, it's a super dynamic language and everything is crazy. So I'm assuming small talk has a similar thing, or maybe it doesn't have this specific cost of having to check arity, but it replaces that with other runtime costs. I think it still need to check. It's just otherwise how it knows it need to do some special handling if the errors is too much or too less. Well, again, that's what JavaScript does, right? I mean, JavaScript, yeah. you know, they just they just roll with it. Or maybe maybe it's like uh, like ML languages or Haskell, like where every function actually only takes one argument. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's also, but I don't know small talk, so. Yeah. But you know, but then you have the problem where like in Haskell, like, well, things can take a tuple, right? So, but let's forget about that. So in Haskell, if everything is like partially applied, then, then you still have the same cost in Haskell, right? It's that when you call the function, you have to check to see if that function returns the thing that returns the thing that returns the thing that can take a, like in the example where let's say you pass too many arguments to a function, right? In our interpreter, we check the length and then we, you know, report an error or something. But in Haskell, what would happen is that, well, this would, you know, do it at compile time, but in if you were to interpret it, what would happen is that if you pass too many arguments to a Haskell function, you would end up trying to call a function on, you know, like a like a literal or something. Yeah, but that case is already covered in our interpreter. It's like we try to call something which is not a function, so we don't yeah, need to do this additional yeah. check. Type checking would cover that in Haskell. Yeah. Yeah, of course, in Haskell, it's compile time. Yes, yeah, so but I'm saying even if it wasn't, there would be another cost. Yeah, right? the, another cost. That's, yeah. so I think it's like in 10.1, like when we do function call, we already covered that case. Yeah. I mean, in Haskell, if, if you want to be a monster, you can also defer your type checks till runtime. But I don't know why anyone would set that compiler play. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes for like running tests, it's nice. Yeah. Um, because Haskell, I mean, oftentimes the compile times take longer than it takes to run your program. That's true. Yeah. So if you're, so for your like unit tests, uh, that makes sense. Yes, I I remember the one other small talk fact I know that the. The JVM I work on, the IBM JVM, a long time ago, it was a good chunk of it was actually implemented in Smalltalk. Hmm. But then none of the new developers knew Smalltalk, so they switched it to C. Also, Smalltalk probably is slow. So, yeah. Yeah, I think there's also a performance thing there. Yeah, you probably don't want to implement JVM on top of. A non native language. All right, challenge number two is the, it's the non -native anonymous language. functions, which doesn't seem like it could be a whole lot more to actually add in. No, yeah. it's actually simpler. <laughs> Uh, actually, when I implement imp uh, an interpreter like this, I usually only implement anonymous functions because, like, the actual standalone function can be seen as a sugar. Yeah, you just make a variable yeah. and then assign it to that. Yeah, whenever I write JavaScript, that's all I do. I just do const whatever equals anonymous function. Yeah. Yeah. You lose some things though when you do that in JavaScript. Like you don't get um uh what is it? You don't get like function hoisting, which can be nice if you want to like, you know, run your code from top to bottom. Then sometimes you want the some functions to be hoisted. Yeah, but I'm writing JavaScript. I've already given up on nice things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
I mean, I, I can't say much. I write C++ in assembly all day, so. Anyways, yeah. so yeah, this tricky anonymous function in an expression statement. I think in that case, you just, the same as any other expression statement, if it's not a call, you just don't do anything really. Yeah. Like if you just had one semicolon, like it would be the same thing. It's just a literal and then nothing. Yeah. Do you have tests for that? I actually wrote a test recently for just having like a semi single semicolon and then my my uh my interpreter crashed. So I was like, Ugh. yeah, I never wrote a test for that. Is this single semicolon? Is that valid locks? It should be. I don't know why I wouldn't. Also, locks is, you know, locks is what you make it. I don't, I don't think there's an official lock spec out there. I mean, there there is the grammar in the book here. Oh, true. Oh, that's a good point. So actually, you we could find out if you uh, if oh, yeah. you go to whatever. No, it would be in it would be in chapter eight. And chapter eight is where we define the grammar for um statements. Um, eight. Yeah, so if you scroll down a little bit, uh, scroll up, up a little bit, there it oh, is. Yeah. Yeah, so it's expression. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I guess it's not legal because an expression statement requires an expression. Yeah. And a semicolon. So, yeah, just an empty semicolon. Empty statement is a syntax error. Interesting. Oh, well, then I guess I didn't need to add that functionality. So uh, your your test performed correctly. Yeah, it did. All right, let's see where we um challenges. All right, yeah, last challenge. Scope A R A equals local. What does locks do in this situation? Yeah, I don't know. I didn't get here, so I, I haven't. Yeah, I didn't get to this point. I feel like it would be an error, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, it locks is an error because locks use the environment like it puts parameter into the environment and there's oh, yeah, so the you're environment as a local environment. Well, but, it, but it wouldn't be an error because you can overwrite with the var statement. Can you? I, I remember well, yeah. in logs, in logs you you can like assign, but I can you can you like do this kind of shadowing stuff in logs? Yeah, you can because when we what was it the last I don't yeah, know, when we talk about variables when it, and it doesn't shadow it just assigns even yeah declarations just yeah right here assignment. oh okay yeah because, oh, okay so it would work with the REPL okay so that's the, I think you want to do on the REPL so you just keep your same oh okay makes sense yeah, yeah. I remember this discussion yeah <laughs> where Oh, no. uh, functions, yeah. So, yeah, it would just overwrite. Yeah, so in most other languages, I answer like the other part of this question is that I believe it would shadow it. So. Yeah. So it's either either it allowed to shadow or it will be an error. Yeah. yeah. Like if you tried to do this in C, I think it'd give you an error trying to. Uh, C C you can do that. Oh no 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 you can't. No. So. Yeah, if you had like think, yeah, just go int a and then int a equals. Yeah. C doesn't allow shadowing in the same scope, which is to be honest, is the most useful form of shadowing. 
Yeah. I mean, there's also the difference that in C, everything is passed by by value. So like everything yeah. is copied. So it wouldn't even be a problem if you reassign to it or not. But still, yeah. sometimes it's a mistake to reassign. Yeah, so. I feel like a construct like this is almost always an error. So it's good to have it like a programming logic error. So it's good to report it as an error. Well, I mean, if you're not, I mean, especially if you're not using it. But no, I've shadowed variables before. Like that can be that can be helpful. Well, yeah, I, I guess it depends. Yeah. What you're doing. But like to to declare a variable and shadow it. So the uh, so in in language uh, a lot of these kind of operations it actually is useful like in OCaml and Rust because I think Rust is inspired by the tr this tradition from OCaml. Uh, yeah, I guess you would do that in Rust where you have your let shadowing. Yeah. Yeah, no. because well, you have something like an optional result, those kind of types, and and then you can sh shadow that when you do your pattern matching. All right, yeah. So yeah, that's that's this chapter. Any other yeah. any comments before I stop sharing my screen here? Okay, we can stop the recording.